Hey everybody, my name is Camille and it is Game of Thrones Theory Time. Now, since episode 7, The Broken Man, I've seen a lot of folks commenting that that didn't quite seem like Arya in that episode. Well, there's a good reason they feel that way. That's because it isn't Arya. It is Jacques and Hagard. Now, I've been thinking about this theory for a long time and I know I'm not the first one to say it, but here's my theory about what's going on with Arya with a little bit more detail. And yes, I have to tell you, it has to do with one very, very long-standing theory. Wait for it. Cereal Pharrell and Jack and Hagard are one and the same. But wait, don't run away just yet. I think by the end of the video, I'll be able to prove it to you. Now, before I jump down this rabbit hole, I know a lot of people have read Macy Williams' interview where she asked the producers if Jacques and Hagard and Cereal Pharrell are the same, and if Cereal is actually dead, and their answer was, and I quote, Pharrell is dead. To me, this is just a play on words, and I'll explain what I mean a little bit later. So before I dig in, there are a few things I'd like to point out and remind you of. They don't explain this in the show, but in the books, the waif is actually 36 years old. She looks like a child because of working with poison, but she's been at the House of Black and White for a really long time. They say she's been there since she was a child, so I'd say no less than 20 years. So no doubt about it, she is a true faceless man. Speaking about faceless men, let's talk about the three rules that they live by. Rule number one, death is just a numbers game. Only death can pay for life. Rule number two, killing for personal gain or out of anger or hate is forbidden. Rule number three, they can only assassinate targets they've been hired to kill and may not choose who is worthy, worthy of the gift by themselves. In plain English, this means they can only kill who they've been instructed to kill. And I say instructed because payment for a faceless man to assassinate someone doesn't always mean money. Depending on what they negotiate, a payment can be different things. So one last side note is we don't know what happens to a faceless man for breaking the rules. That being said, I have to admit I am not entirely a, like a full-on book reader. I'm a Cliff Notes kind of girl. I try to base my theories on what the show shows us. But if I do mention something from the books and I'm not correct, please feel free to enlighten me because I haven't read like cover to cover. Okay, I admit it. So anyway, let's jump down this little rabbit hole together. I'm going to start with Serio. So I won't go too deep into his backstory, but he does have one in the books, which to me means that he was actually a real guy. He is from Bravos, and he served as the first sword for nine years before moving to King's Landing, where we know he was a water dancing teacher. Um, he was the first sword to the Sea Lord of the Free Cities, and the Sea Lord is kind of like the person in charge, but they're different from a king because they're chosen. It's not like given by birth like it is in King's Landing. And the first sword is kind of the Sea Lord's right-hand man. He's his champion. He's with him all the time. They live in the palace together, all that good stuff. He's kind of like the Lord Commander of the King's Guard, but he's called the first sword. Anyway, this means that Serial was a pretty badass sword fighter, and he was a highly known and respected kind of dude. Now, I mention this only... I mention this because the only way that the Sea Lord cannot be the Sea Lord anymore is if he dies. And yes, people do murder the Sea Lords. So, Serial got his position as the first sword by a newly appointed Sea Lord and only served nine years. So, I wonder if the Sea Lord died or something. In the books, there's this whole plot with Dorn and the secret pact to marry Duran Martell's daughter to Viserys Targaryen, and this whole secret plot to help take back the Iron Throne. And apparently there was only one witness to this pact, and it was an unnamed Sea Lord. Now just looking at the time frame, it would match up with when Serio was the first sword, but all of this is unknown. I'd really have to do some more reading, but as I was researching this, I just feel like there might be some connection with the whole thing, with the Sea Lord dying and Serial moving away from Bravos. Maybe there's a, like a true book reader out there that could tell me more about it, but I'll leave the rest of that alone for now. Um, anyway, let's get back into my theory. Um, we all know what went down. We know how it started. Ned hired Serial to teach Arya how to use her needle, and he has some great lines like this. Hey. Who are you? Your dancing master, Sirio Forel. Tomorrow you will catch it. No. What if I drop it? The steel must be part of your arm. Can you drop part of your arm? No. 
Nine years, Cyril Ferrer was first sought to the Sea Lord of Bravos. He knows these things. You must listen to me, boy. I'm a girl. Boy, girl. You are a sword. That is Which could parallel Jacquin's lines like this. A boy becomes a girl. I was always a girl. And I was always aware. But the girl keeps secrets. And we also get this famous Syrio quote. That is right. Do you pray to the gods? The old Amundi. There is only one god. And his name is death. And there is only one thing we say to death. Not today. Which could parallel what Jacques says right place. here. There is only one god. A girl knows his name, and all men know his gift. Okay, I know what you're thinking. That's easy stuff. If you watch the season more than twice, you can pr probably figure that out. But I've got a little bit more at my sleeve, I promise. It gets more interesting. More interesting? More interesting. Anyway, so then we have the final scene with Sirio, where we see him take down a bunch of Lannister guards to protect Arya. We see him make it or take out the guards like it's nothing, and then he squares up with Mary and Trant, and then we never see him again. Now, true, we never saw him die on screen, which in Game of Thrones, Thrones logic means he can always come back. Plus, we know that Trant's alive. Well, he was alive after that happened, so it's easy to assume that Sirio didn't make it out of there. And just like the producer said, I do think that Sirio is actually dead, but there's a catch, and I'll get to that in a minute. So let's fast forward a little bit up to season two. We have Arya who's pretending to be a boy and she's with this group on their way to the Night's Watch. There's where she meets Jacken, who is a prisoner. Remember these guys? These prisoners were taken from what they call the Black Cells in King's Landing. Now I don't remember if they talk about this on the show, but the Black Cells are reserved for the worst of the worst prisoners. It's kind of like the maximum security prison of King's Landing. I didn't put this together until recently, so just in case somebody else didn't catch this either, the other two prisoners with Jacquin were part of a bear fighting ring. Remember when Brienne had to fight a bear? Yeah, it was those guys that were part of that. One thing I'd like to point out is that we never actually hear why Jacquin was arrested or why he was in the black cells, at least not on the show or in the cliff notes that I read. Now, if they do say why this happened in the books, please let me know. Anyhow, this group gets attacked and the prisoners are about to burn to death in their cages. Remember this scene? Sweet Arya saves them. Unfortunately, they all get captured by the Lannister men right after, and they're taken captive and sent to Harren Hall. Now, while they're there, Jacquin becomes a Lannister guard, and Arya be Ari becomes, who's still pretending to be Arya, a boy, by the way, she becomes Tywin Lannister's little personal servant. Now, here's a quick little scene from when these two finally bump into each other at Harren Hall after they're captured. The man pays his debts. The man owes three. Three what? The red god takes what is his, lovely girl. And only death may pay for life. You saved me and the two I was with. You stole three deaths from the red god. We have to give them back. Speak three names. And the man will do the rest. So this is a very important scene. So let's go over a couple of things. Jacques tells, or is telling Arya that since she has saved three lives, she can pick three lives to replace them. He talks about how a debt is owed. He says, the red god takes what is his, and only death may pay for life. You stole three deaths from the red god, and we have to give them back. So Arya picks two names, and he kills them like he said he would, but she wants the third to be Tywin Lannister, and the problem is she wants it done like right now. And Jacquin is like, I can't do that, I need some time, it doesn't work that way, and this frustrates her, so she names him as the third person to kill, and he kind of freaks out, he's like, take it back. She's like, no, he's like, take it back. Anyway, they kind of come to an agreement, and, and the agreement is, is if he 
helps her and her friends escape from there, she'll take his name back. So that night, and I'm going to show this clip. Hold on. It must be others. Give a name, any name. And you killed them. Anybody. By the seven new gods and the old gods beyond counting, I swear it. Sorry for the subtitles, but I love right. Jack and Space in this scene. Jack and Hagar. Priceless. <laughs> Hagar gives a man his own name. That's right. Gods are not mocked. This is no joking thing. I'm not joking. Man can go kill himself. Unname me. No. Please. I'll name you. Thank you. If you help me and my friends escape. <laughs> this would require more than one life. This is not part of our bargain. Fine. Jack and Hagar. Hagar likes honor. Okay, so there's two guards up there. One dead guard. And two dead guards. That brings Jacques and Hagar's death count to four. Not just three, but there's a reason. Arya saved Jacken's life again by taking his name back, therefore a replacement in his ode, so he's able to kill an additional person. And technically, Arya asked him to. She just wasn't specific about it this time. Remember, when the many face, with the many-faced god, it's just a numbers game. Who the person is really doesn't matter. Now, I can't lie to you. The first time I saw this scene years ago, it went right over my head. I thought he was letting Arya pick three people because he was paying her back for saving him. Now I realize that it really didn't have that much to do with Arya at all. Now he was being nice, but actually he had her pick those names because he can't. We have to refer, refer back to rule number three. A faceless man is not allowed to choose who he kills. Three lives were stolen from death, so they needed to be replaced. It doesn't actually matter who it is. They just need to be replaced. It's like a one-for-one -one swap, and Jacqueline, Jacqueline, as a faceless man, is not allowed to choose the replacement um, for his own reasons. Death seems like a greedy son of a bitch, doesn't he? Well, anyway, let's get back to Sirio and watch the scene from when he fights the Lannister guards. See if you can notice this huge, gigantic clue that could potentially link Sirio and Jacqueline together. He's out of my way, little man. I... I'm Sirio Foran. Foreign bastard. And you will be speaking to me with more respect. Kill the Bravosi. Bring the girl. Arya child, we are done with dancing for the day. Run to your father. does not run. What do we say to the God of Death? Not today. So did you catch it? Did you get the big clue? Okay, I'm going to spell it out for you here. Sirio is fighting this whole gang of men and they're all in armor and they have fancy swords and shields. All he has is a wooden sword and he takes them down literally with one hand behind his back for most of the fight, right? Well, the wooden sword is the big clue. Sirio doesn't actually kill anybody. There's no blood on his seat, nothing. There's, he doesn't kill anybody. He hits a lot of people upside the head, he busts a couple of kneecaps, but nobody dies. 
These idiot guards roll around on the floor like they're in a WrestleMania commercial break, just like, oh God, it hurts, blah, blah, blah. But, and Serio being the badass swordsman that he is, the first sword of Bravos, I'm sure at some point he could have reached down and grabbed one of their swords and done some real damage, but nope, he's stuck with the wooden one. Why in the hell would he do that? Why didn't he kill anybody? Maybe because of rule number three. A faceless man cannot choose who he kills on his own, bitches. That's it right there. If he is actually, like, he's he's shocking. It's happening. Anyway, watch this part again. We know that the show likes to play with double meanings. And here I think that he is talking to both Arya and Marin Trant at the same time. I'm sorry I'm banging on my computer. I'm excited. Anyway, watch this scene. What do we say to the god of death? Not today. Ooh, so, Serial looked Marin Trant right in his face, like got up in his grill and was like, what do we say to death? Basically, he's like, Bitch, you are lucky I cannot kill you. Because if I could kill you, I would kill you. I would I would kill the fuck out of you right now, but I can't. So not today, bitch. Not today. You'll get yours, but not today. Anyway, this video's gone on way longer than I planned it to. So I'm going to end up doing two parts of a video. So this is part number one. I hope that you enjoyed this so far. I promise video number two, I'm going to tie everything that I just talked about all together and explain how Jacques and Hagar is actually Arya and how the whole thing is going to go down and how Serio gets tied into that whole thing. And I think I got this whole shit figured out. I feel like I'm really smart right now. I'm really proud of myself. But anyway, uh, go ahead and check out part two of the video. And once you're done watching the whole thing, tell me what you think. Thanks for watching.